Um, so I'm very happy to welcome uh, Jeff Jewell for the uh, the Family Welcome Talk today. Um, I first met Jeff over the summer at the Jet Propulsion Lab in uh, Pasadena, California. Um, I think the uh, first time we met we just were going to go out for coffee or something like that. And uh, we ended up talking for like the whole afternoon about all the interesting problems that Jeff is working on. And uh, so we'll hear about uh, one of them that took up a lot of the time. Uh, Jeff's going to be telling us about today, so I'm really excited to hear the full story. Um, just a few things about Jeff. He uh, actually has an interesting connection to one of our own here, Steve Strogat. So uh, Jeff was at MIT for undergrad and took an yeah, early version of Steve's non famous nonlinear dynamics course. Um, Jeff did his PhD in astrophysics at the University of Chicago. Um, and I've been doing stuff uh, related to measuring the cosmic microwave background of said that correctly, yeah. and sort of on the computational and theoretical end of that. Yeah. Um, so that's what led Jeff to uh, JPL, um, where he worked on the plane project, which actually, uh, you know, an actual real life mission. Uh, so his work is helping us to learn things about the cosmic microwave background and the secrets of the early universe. And, uh, Today he's going to talk to you about a totally different project. Um, so he's got he's got a whole handful. So if you're interested in some of the other stuff he works on, feel free to ask him afterwards. Um, I should also say this is uh, this visit is funded by Engage Cornell, which is promoting some sort of interaction between industry, lab, and academic environments. So uh, afterwards, when there's questions, you're welcome to ask Jeff about uh, what working at JPL is like. Also, it's a unique environment. So. All right, with that, welcome. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, it's really fun to be here. It's been a great day, and just I've never been to Cornell before at Ithaca, so to me, it's just great. Wonder Wonderland, and good to see Andrew again and meet people here. So, and thanks, uh, Erica, for helping just organize all this, and Alex for the invitation, and Andrew as well for getting that set up. So, um, okay. So yeah, I'm going to talk about. A little bit of a switch from the cosmic wave background. What happened? That, speaking to maybe the last part, um, how did I wind up doing this? That's one of the nice things about working at a place like JPL. There's a lot of different projects and missions going on, and if you learn something in one field or just get interested in other things, and you want to just learn new things and develop new skills, there's a lot of other projects. And Exoplanet uh, things have been ramping up at JPL and NASA in general is one of the key science schools, and, and uh, so I got involved in, uh, in this in this work I'll talk about today. Um, okay. So we would like to try, we're detecting exoplanets. I'm sure you guys have read the news. I think we're up to several thousand, three, four thousand, or we're closing in on 4,000 other planets around other stars detected. Um, we detect these things fundamentally by, in three different ways. One is basically a planet goes in front of the star. You can monitor how bright the star is, and you'll see a dip in the light curve. So you can see how oh, something went in front of it. You can actually do this in different wavelength bands and learn and probe something about the atmosphere of the planet. So that's called the transit spectroscopy method. I'm not going to talk about that. There's another method called the radial velocity method. You can uh, put the light from the star and the planet down a single mode fiber into a high resolution spectrograph. And the planet that you're seeing is actually, your, its light that's coming to you is reflected from the star. It's also orbiting. So what's cool is you'll see the stellar spectrum with a Doppler shifted version of that spectrum right on top. So you can watch and see, oh, there's a planet there because I see a Doppler shifted spectrum in there. You can even try to infer things about the orbital parameters of it as well. What we really also like to do, again, is to directly image these planets, um, spatially resolve these other worlds from the host star. And ultimately, one of the main motivations is that we'd like to just directly get the spectrum of that planet and look for if, if there's any signatures of life. Can we detect the presence of molecular ions in the atmosphere of the planet that would indicate some sort of life on this planet? So it's one way that we might learn that there's life elsewhere in the universe through remote sensing. Okay, so what's it going to take to pull that off? Um, we've, you know, we know about we've we've mapped out stars in our galaxy, and within 50 parsecs, um, a parsec is about three light years. Can we find planets that are Earth-like? So some just back the envelope numbers. Um, if you have a, a star like the Sun, hosting a planet at one AU, and that star is 10 to 50 parsecs away, which is where most of these targets will be in our galaxy. The angular separation of that, of that planet and that star, the angular separation of 1 AU is very small, 0.1 to 0.02 arc seconds. Um, as I'm going to talk about later, um, a finite aperture telescope 
when it collects all this light, a, a point source of infinity is not a perfect delta function in your focal plane because of the finite size of the aperture. And it's, it has a characteristic pattern called the area pattern. And so it has a finite width that's directly in, uh, inversely proportional to the width of the telescope aperture. So I'm going to call that just a resolution element. That you can't really resolve anything uh, below that. If this is the star, and you want to do at least detect the planet right there, spatially resolve the planet, and let's just say you want to put it two or three diffraction uh, resolution elements away, and you, and you have a 1 AU at 10 parsecs or up to 50 parsecs, it's going to take a telescope diameter of 3.4, 10, or 17 meters for the planet. So it's a big, a very big telescope to see a planet at 1 AU. And for comparison, Hubble is 2.4 meters. So the challenge of trying to directly image Earth-like planets, get its spectra, look for signatures of life, is driving us to very large space-based telescopes. We're pushing telescopes, by the way, this large on the ground. Keck and Mauna Kea, I forgot exactly its diameter, it's on the order of 10 -ish. And in Chile, um, they're building telescopes that will be on the order of 30 meters in a couple of years. Um, so really big telescopes, there's some technical challenge, challenges there. We're gonna wanna get um, above the atmosphere and do this from space. Making this, also very hard is that we're only getting the reflected uh, sun or reflected starlight. And so this planet is 10 billion times brighter than the star. And so we somehow have to figure we need, we're, we're driven into large apertures, uh, large telescopes to collect enough light, spatially resolve the planet from the star. But we also need to do something called high contrast imaging. We have to somehow basically completely block out all this starlight, but then immediately next to it let as much light as possible through. So that presents a, a, a challenge. And what I'll talk about today are techniques that, of, of designing optical instruments that will let us uh, do this. Okay. So I just want to say something. I, I thought this was really exciting the first time I saw this. We're already directly imaging uh, exoplanets. These are not Earth-like planets. These, this particular system, star 8799, uh, 40 parsecs away, and it's five times brighter than the sun. These are all uh, like what we call hot Jupiters. Um, they're like four times as massive as, as Jupiter. There's a couple reasons why we can directly image those now, even from the ground. They're much further away from the, from the star. They're also so massive that they're also emitting their own light, particularly at long wavelengths. Um, so you know, for example, Jupiter was almost a star. If it had a little bit more mass, it would have turned on in its core, and we would have a binary system in our solar system. So these guys are emitting light more like in the infrared uh, and the longer wavelengths. Um, so we can, we can see them, they're brighter, it's not just reflected light, and they're further away. Um, so we're, we were already directly imaging uh, planets, and what we would like to do is basically do this. Uh, the Earth-like guys are going to be much, much closer, as I said, 1 AU. Um, so we have the challenge of probing the innermost regions. It's going to drive us to the larger telescope apertures, as I said, to just spatially resolve the planet from the star. And then we've got to work with uh, suppressing 10, by 10 orders of magnitude the light from the star and basically create an eclipse in the, in the uh, instrument. Okay, so science, or, uh, NASA right now is coming up on something called the Decadal Review. In 2020, basically NASA and uh, the Academy of Sciences will revisit what are the priorities for NASA for, uh, for the next round of missions. And one of the two main um, uh, kind of mission concept studies that have been selected to provide input into the Decadal Review to decide uh, are these two mission concepts, LUBOR, the Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Surveyor, and HAVEX. And they're kind of going, uh, they're slightly different strategies. Um, LUBOR is one of these really big, like 15 meter segmented mirrors uh, that we'll put uh, out at the second Lagrange point and uh, be well away from the Earth and we've got this massive uh, sunshade. Um, so that's, that's the one option, just a very large segmented aperture telescope. HAVEX is a little bit smaller and it's potentially looking at another technology that might help you Suppress the, suppress the starlight, called a star shade. This thing is uh, like 100 uh, meters in diameter and, and hundreds of thousands of kilometers away. It has to free fly together with the telescope and block out the starlight. The, the uh, performance of this thing and, and suppressing starlight and letting planet light through is phenomenal. It's basically perfect. You get all planet lighting, no starlight. But you can imagine it's got its own set of engineering challenges. So the option, another option is just to have this little instrument called the Chrono Graph that's sitting right inside the Space Telescope itself, and it's got its own set of problems. That, and that's all that I'll be focusing on the Chrono Graph today. Um, okay, so a couple little bit of, a little bit of background on some optics, telescopes, and then we'll jump into what's involved in suppressing starlight so we can see the planets. So there's two basic architectures. 
Now they each have their strengths and weaknesses for large aperture space telescopes. Um, one, and why are, what's the challenge here? We've got to take something 15 meters in diameter and we've got to stuff it into a rocket to get it up. Or we've got to put it up in pieces and assemble it or something else. Um, so it's, it's challenging to assemble something that big. Um, you, you've, got a, you've got a huge thing that's trying to collect all this light, and you've got to get all of that light stuffed into your instruments. So how do you route the light to get to the instruments? There's two kind of ways to do it. You have your big collecting area, the primary mirror, here both for the uh, centrally obscured telescope and the off-axis. All the light comes in, so point source at infinity is basically emitting light in spherical wave rows. But it's at infinity, so you're putting, capturing a little cross-section of the sphere, so it's like a planar wavefront for you. So that's represented kind of by these lines. Uh, these lines are representing um, the wavefront constant phase, or orthogonal to the lines of constant phase. So we're just kind of treating the light now from this diagram, this uh, race. So the light comes in, bounces off this curved primary mirror, and we can put a secondary out here. That captures that light from blasting back off into space, and then we bring it right back down through a hole in the primary, goes to a network of other mirrors and finally into our current car. Um, another option, so there's challenges here. It's easier, it's easier architecturally just to have this in a rocket and have it deploy. It's a little bit easier to do that. But as you can guess, you're blocking part of the starlight and it actually will cause all kinds of problems for diffracted light that you want to suppress from the star. So I'll talk about that. This one is much, much better, but it's, uh, it's, it's an off-axis telescope. So it's slightly tilted, the light comes in, bounces in a secondary that's actually not in projection in this area, so the light doesn't even see it. It just this full collecting area can uh, take in photons. Bounce it off the secondary and then go into the instrument. It's a little more difficult and the support structure to have this thing is long, and so this tends to be a little bit smaller in diameter and what you can achieve, things of that nature. So you've got trade-offs, but I'll show designs for uh, both of these. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, we've kind of set the stage and set the context of how I'm getting all this starlight. And I'm going to then, for the rest of the talk, just be referring to the coronagraph itself. So light comes in, bounces through, comes in to the little, just like this is the telescope collecting all the light from the, from the star planet. And I don't know if it's the telescope, what we call a pupil plane. The coronagraph is going to have a little entrance, what we call a pupil plane here. So ideally, all of this optics that's routing all the light would basically just re-image this telescope pupil here. So in the talk, you'll see pictures of what looks like a telescope in aperture phase harm. You'll see it if it's right here, because the optics are supposed to re-image that light right here. And ideally, it would do it with no change in the phase of the light. So it would be perfect uniform way from here, if possible. Um, OK, so what do we do? We're going to have different components. What a coronagraph tries to do, what was that? Was that last year, two years ago, we had the awesome eclipse here in the States? Was that last year? Was last last year. Last year. Yeah. That's, what, that's what this instrument is trying to do. A coronagraph historically is called a coronagraph because I think it was uh, Leo in France uh, wanted to study the corona of the sun, so he needed to block out the bright solar disk. So just like the moon blocks out the sun, so you can see the much dimmer corona, that's exactly what this instrument tries to do, it tries to create an eclipse. How do we do that? We take the light. We bounce off some deformable mirrors, which are key to controlling the phase and controlling the wavefront in such a way that we can suppress the starlight at the final way through. We go through a few other planes, avidization possibly, we go to a focal plane. I'm going to talk about all these different planes. And then we finally get to the final focal plane where we have a detector. So I think this is like, you know, what's behind your iPhone camera or something. It's just collecting all the light. Intensity squared, that's what you are for. Okay. So also I just want to introduce a little background of optics. Um, if you could start from Maxwell's equations, not worry about the vector nature of the electric field, just so we're not worried about polarization, scalar field, complex scalar field, and ask how it propagates a solution to a wave equation. You can write down the Green's function. A couple of approximations later, if the distance that it propagates is much longer than the wavelength of the light, you arrive at something called the Fresnel propagator. So the that's it. The way that by G U V, I mean the complex electric field, say, in, uh, in, in this plane, what is, if I know the complex electric field in this plane, how does it propagate and what is the complex electric field at another plane downstream? And it's just based on um, uh, Huygens' principle that basically the whole wavefront itself, you can think of it as a bunch of point sources, um, emitting spherical light, you add all those guys up. Uh, so you add up all those complex guys, and that expresses that physical uh, property. So, 
Um, there's something interesting, the reason why I wanted to write down this equation is to give you a little flavor then of why the math works out the way it does. Um, if you put, what, it, what basically, what does a lens do? A lens just modifies the phase factor inside here to leave you with a pure Fourier transform. You can recognize these guys. After, there's an approximation between here and here that is very accurate again at long distances compared to the wavelength. And so what you see is that the relationship in one plane relative to the other is can be computed numerically and is physically a Fourier transform. So that's why Fourier optics is, is used here. Um, and when we talk about then a pupil and a focal plane, what we do for a, in going from a pupil to a focal plane, a lens is all it is is uh, modifying the phase at every point such that you're left with a pure Fourier transform. So a focal plane is literally a Fourier transform of a pupil plane. You can choose objects to do that. The other piece that I want maybe us to remember in this talk is that mathematically you can represent, represent traditional optics. If you look at this whole thing as a linear operator, you factored that linear operator as a product of Fourier transforms and complex diagonal matrices. So if you have any kind of optical system and you want to design it to have some input-output response, um, go off and write down you know, analytically maybe what that ideal linear operator would be, and, and, and then you want factoring, but it's a particular factorization. So just like when you numerically solve things and you want to invert something, you know, similar value decomposition or some other factorization, um, optics lets you do a particular type of factorization. So that's good and also hard. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how that turns out. What about more general matrix operations? Can I get off the diagonal? Can I multiply in optics in hardware by general matrices? And so the answer is um, yes, in principle, and we'll come back to some hardware and some technology development that's letting us move in that direction. Okay, so pupil plane, focal plane is a Fourier transform of pupil plane. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to get this straight. You have the input light coming through with the little through the telescope, and then yep. you're transforming that with this equation and then projecting it back out to the screen or whatever you're looking at it on, and that's Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically like um, uh, you want to image the planet or the star. So point source and infinity, yeah, and thanks for asking that question because I've got to explain this. The, the your intersect the, these are these uh, images are supposed to represent you're intersecting the little little patch of that big giant spherical wavefront, right? So it looks flat. The reason it's circular is this was what a circular aperture telescope would look like. The the light the point source and why is it why is it a point source right at the center? Because I I'm pointing the telescope right at the star. So that means it's uniform wavefront. A planet a planet just off. Um, so here's our telescope star. That's the uniform. The planet over here, its spherical surfaces, this is no longer a surface of constant phase. Your inner, its spherical surfaces from the planet have slight phase variation now. And that, um, oh, I just put that, sorry. Okay. So that's what, that's what a planet looks like in the pupil plane because the spherical ripples coming out from the planet, uh, when they intersect the telescope aperture, they're no longer a surface of constant phase, like that. And then, but I want to image them. So that's why I want to go to a focal plane. I want to Fourier transform this aperture to get it down to a point, to get all that light down to a point. And that's what you're doing when you're imaging, you know, when you uh, have a camera. It takes all this light and it brings it to a focus to give you sharp images. So. Okay. Um, so how does your chronograph work? We said it's just trying to create an eclipse. So <coughs> let's trace through that again. Um, as we go through different planes that I'm going to talk about later in the program. So here we have the star coming in, and the pupil it looks like this. The planet looks like this. And it goes through these deformable mirrors. I'm going to talk about, but let's forget those for a minute. I come to a, this pupil plane, which is the same as this pupil plane. I then Fourier transform it and go to the image plane. Um, maybe you can turn off those lights, because the, the, the slides are a little hard. Is that OK back there, Eric? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so what would I see? I would see the star. And I'd see the planet. Now, this is, um, these are equal amplitude. Remember, this other second dot, the planet, is 10 to the minus 10 dimmer than this other guy. And remember also, it, it, around each of these, I have the diffraction rings of the area pattern on top. I would, I would not see this dot, I would just see all those rings. So if I just go to the final focal plane, there it is. So how can I try to create an eclipse? The obvious way, a focal plane, I've concentrated all the starlight, ideally in as tight a point as possible. The diffraction rings are what cause all the trouble, but to first order, I can just put the moon there, just like the moon happily crosses the sun. And so here I am, I'm putting a little black dot, and it would absorb all the light there, it doesn't pass, but it lets the planet right there go through. So I'm showing you, I bring the star and planet through to this plane, 
Here I'm blocking out that point, so that's the point that's left after passing through that piece of glass with a dark hole on it. And then I go back to a pupil plane. There's still some more of, the, uh, of this airy ring stuff that then goes to this pupil plane. But Leo was really smart. He realized he could have a slightly undersized uh, uh, pupil plane stop and absorb some of the light on the outer part and then go to a final focal plane and it suppresses even more the diffraction starlight. So that works pretty well. And again, one of the things now we're going to get to is we have really good ways of suppressing the starlight and letting planet light through for simple telescope apertures for circular apertures. Here's another one that's kind of amazing. Okay? This one's amazing because what I just showed you there is basically what we can classify as an apodization family of solution, although this isn't a focal plane. You can also apodize in a pupil plane. It's basically a, a solution of trying to absorb light to suppress starlight. There's another family which is crazy, which is completely energy conserving, and it only does it by phase. And this is a really cool math, math trick. Um, uh, if you guys are familiar with um, integrating with uh, orbital angular momentum modes and things like that. So it turns out, a, a compact supported circle, uniform circle, if you integrate its Fourier transform with uh, this e to the i phi, phi is a phase that's just a polar angle, the polar angle. So in polar coordinates, uh, it's the same phase at every radius, but as you go around this, and L is what we call the topological charge. And there's a little phase singularity there. So you know what happens right at that point when the phase is up in front. If you integrate the Fourier transform with this, with this, you get perfectly zero inside this region. And all of the, it's energy preserving, right? It's a unitary, a Fourier transform times e to the i something times an inverse Fourier transform is, you take its adjoint, that's its inverse, it's, it, it conserves energy. So we lost no light here. What happened to the light? It went completely outside this region, and there's zero light. It only happens for that mode. It only happens for that uniform field circular aperture, which is this pupil uh, thing of the star. It's perfect. So all you have to do then is put a Leo stop that's just a little bit undersized, and there is zero in our paper. You still have to build these things, which is challenging. Um, zero starlight gets through. And almost, I, almost an ideal maximum amount of planet light will get through. This tilted mode that I showed uh, pretty much goes right through, uh, right through that phase. So it's, it's amazing. OK, here's the challenge, though. We want to directly use the Earth-like planets. They're really close. Um, to the stars far away, we've got to get to big apertures. We don't we don't know how to build telescopes on the order of 15 meters out of just a single mirror with no structure on it at all. So we so what do we do? We seg we segment. We have a bunch of these little segments and we just tie them together. And then amazingly, you have to control the rigid body position of these guys to ridiculous tolerances. Um, and I'll, later I'll mention like we're talking about picometers type precision that we're going to need to be able to do this. So it opens up a whole other field that we're working at now on demonstrating advanced uh, uh, methods of wavefront sensing and control, closed loop control, to actually acquire the right shape and hold it um, while we're um, also then suppressing the starlight. And so it's a, it's a whole host of really interesting challenging problems. So can we take advantage of the perfect, you know, ideal chrono graph solutions that work for uniform uh, circular apertures, can we do that with segmented apertures? Um, okay, that's right, so um, Okay, so a simple algorithm. To do this, actually, uh, I'm gonna talk about, about that first. Intuitively, um, here, here's some notation. Q is, uh, is this region in the final focal plane where I need to suppress all the starlight. It's where I think I might find a planet. So, in that focal plane, Here's, um, uh, here, if I did not block any starlight, I maybe have that PSF core of the star sitting there, but I don't want that. Um, I expect to have a planet, remember I said, you know, 15 meters is around where you might find a 1AU planet at 20 parsecs, you know, around three resolution elements. So in the notation we might see later is lambda over D just basically refers to this kind of a spacing. Um, and so I, basically I'm interested in suppressing starlight, you know, uh, on the order of like 10 lambda over D. If I go out further, I'll see more, more things. Some planetary trace systems have disks. You know, you can image way out. But I need to suppress in a small, in a pretty small area here at the focal plane. And it's fine if starlight goes everywhere outside. Okay. So by Q, by Q, I mean it's a little, I'm just referring to the region. 
where I need to suppress the star light. C is going to be, I'm representing the entire action on the light as just a linear operator C. And it's going to be fixed. Um, I'm going to actually, everything I talk about now is going to be for this vortex chronograph. So C here is going to be fixed by a particular one of those weird looking vortex base masks here. Um, a Leo stop and all of this is fixed. And my target is to completely block out the starlight in a particular region in the final sonic focal point. W is just representing the electric field here at this plane. Incident right before it goes down the chronograph. Um, so here's a little objective function you can write down. It's very intuitive and it's simple. It just says, what should the electric field be right here at this pupil plane before it goes through the chronograph such that I get no light in the dark, in what we call the dark hole in that region. But it has to be constrained. This could be zero. I could have put a brick wall here and I would make that vanish. So how do I regularize this problem? I regularize it by saying, this electric field better not be too far away from the actual physical field that I got from the telescope through my formal layers. So what I do then is I, I'm going to alternate. I introduce this fictitious field, this degree of freedom, which isn't the real physical field. I say, what should it be? And then I ask my deformable mirrors or other phase control that I have to take the input from the telescope body and try to hit that target. And then I can iterate. And uh, just to attach words to it, um, it's, it's kind of a version of what's called expectation maximization as a way of optimizing for your phase control degrees of freedom uh, to drive these star lights to zero in that region. All right, so what I'm gonna show you now is um, you can actually just analytically compute the W's, what's hard is that the deformable mirrors, your phase control, are E to the I something. You're going to change the phase of the light and E to the I change the phase. I've got two planes. That turns it into a nonlinear, non convex problem. That's what's challenging. But if we can solve for the target W, it's a little bit easier to then back the gut because this is all unitary. So that's kind of where the intuition of the algorithm comes from. What do the W's look like? They look kind of cool. Um, uh, you can just analyt you analytically can solve. Um, well, I should say that you can that. You can analytically, yes, write, write this down. Numerically, this is challenging to invert this matrix. Um, C is singular. And I'm also trying to solve something in a pupil plane, and we tend to want to sample that highly with many pixels. So this tends to be a pretty big matrix, like a blue black or whatever, depending on the sampling that you want and the number of pixels you use to describe these apertures. Um, I, I didn't write it down in the slide, but there's a nice little matrix trick I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, if you need to invert uh, a matrix like this, uh, the Sherman Woodbury uh, form. I hope everybody can see that okay. Um, you can basically turn, this is a great little trick whenever you have to invert matrices. If it's products of things and, and something inside is not full rank, you can turn it inside out. Um, remember, Q is a really small region. So it turns out the number of pixels I need the focal point to sample this accurately is not too many. And so I actually brute force compute and, and uh, compute this matrix and brute force invert it. And then I solve for the pupil plane field with all those pixels uh, in this manner. You can rec you also recognize this as it's a projection into the null space of the chronograph. This is a numerical way of actually computing a projection of the light into the null space, and that's what it looks like. So for this particular aperture, this is one of the designs for Lubar that we were looking at. As six rings of hex, you know, so these different patterns depend on the aperture, it depends on the actual mode that the on axis star, um, what that mode is. And saw this expression, and this is the real imaginary part of the ideal W, it's the projection of this mode into the null space of the vortex chronograph downstream. It gives you a perfect dark hole. If you had optics, if you, sorry, if you have optics, or if you have, if you can find a way to warp the deformable mirrors and change the phase so that it takes this mode to these modes, you're done. You have perfect starlight suppression. Um, so iterating then, solving for the W, back propagating and taking the difference in phase and iterating, uh, converges to a local minimum that luckily works. Um, so for Lubor, for a point source alone, I'm showing you the solutions. At every pixel, if I had an optical element that could change the phase here in this plane, the first deformable mirror and the second deformable mirror, here's what those solutions would look like so that when I put this through those deformable mirrors and then the chronograph, I'm showing you the dark hole at three different wavelengths. So we're able to achieve the 10 orders of magnitude suppression uh, with those solutions. So that's great. We actually have 
a complex diagonal matrix uh, here, such that this overall unitary operator upstream of the singular operator, by definition, is able to do the rotation in the function space from this mode into something that the chronograph can suppress. And I'm saying those words because we're going to come back to that, uh, come back to that at the fourth end. This is a really critical kind of plot and characteristic of the solutions that um, anytime you design a program, you're losing light, right? And so it's always important to understand how much of the, of the light, which would be the planet light, can get through as a function of that angular separation. So zero is right where the star is because I've pointed my telescope to the star perfectly. Um, and so we expect to see, you know, we're going to be looking for Earth right around here. And so, um, you know, you, you're going to need at least, uh, whatever percentage you have, the lower that is, obviously, the longer you're going to have to integrate with your detector to get your signal to noise higher and higher. Um, uh, these are two technical ways of measuring the amount of energy. One is how much energy falls in the core of the planet PSF and how much of it is still just scattered out. I'll, I'll just mention one other thing because it motivates what I look at later in the talk. One of the dangers of putting too much phase on the wavefronts is that it can maybe suppress the starlight, but it can also completely smear out the planet light, the focal plane, which is just as bad because it means all that light is now going to all these individual pixels and the signal to noise of the overall signal is, is, is deleted. Okay, uh, same map except there's a different family of solutions than apodized, apodized solutions. Why, do, why does apodization work? Um, one way of thinking about it is we saw the early pattern, right? The diffraction ripples are what causes the problem. If there's some way I could squeeze that light and concentrate it down, that would be another great way to then just block it or concentrate it so that it would basically be separate from the planet light. What's a Fourier transform of a Gaussian? Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, right? So in a pupil plane, remember, Fourier transform of a Gaussian, Gaussian. So in the focal plane, you'd have a small little Gaussian and, you know, and big Gaussian over the pupil. So you can imagine if you put a Gaussian pattern in your pupil plane, as the light comes through, it would Gaussianize it, taper it down at the end, and then give you potentially a more concentrated beam in the focal plane, something like a Gaussian. That's kind of maybe an intuition of why apodization can help you with this game, it can concentrate the light and therefore separate the diffraction, diffracted light from the planet. Well, what does it look like for a general segment of aperture? So we use the same algorithm, where again, I solve for what's the ideal field, and then what do I do? Then what I do is I say, what is the grayscale thing I can multiply the amplitude of the incoming light such that it matches the, at least the modulus of the uh, ideal field, and you iterate that algorithm, and this is the interesting way uh, what you get back. And we were, you know, at the time we, we did this study, we were looking at a range of, of, of apertures because we're kind of wondering what's the right uh, telescope to try to build, and they all have certain weaknesses. Here's the off axis family of, um, of uh, telescopes, and here's the on axis that I had mentioned earlier, where we've got the secondary mirror uh, there. And you can run this algorithm for all this family and get, get these different optimization patterns. Um, the thing to note, of course, is that. Some apertures are way better than others because the darker this is, the more overall planet light you're also locking. So depending on the architecture of the way you design your telescope, you're gonna have much more throughput with some than others. Again, you, the trade-off here is um, the off-axis skies might be smaller, but they let a lot of light through. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention is that the nice thing about uh, these optimization solutions is that whenever you just only change the modulus of the light, it's achromatic, it's not really independent. And one of the things we have to do is make this work over as wide a wavelength band pass as possible. Whenever you change the surface of the deformable mirror, the amount of phase shift the light gets is wavelength dependent. So it turns out it's chromatic. The vortex, not only is it amazing because it's unitary and energy conserving, but it, because it's self-similar in a focal plane, different wavelengths just kind of look like self-similar guys, so the vortex is actually achromatic. So it looks the same for all wavelengths. It's an amazing optical device. So apposition has the drawback of not letting as much light through, but it's a but it's a chromatic. So it might it might win. So step work in progress to study all these things. Again, showing you the throughput comparisons, of course, the apodizer does not let as much light through, but it has the advantage that it's wavelength, uh, pretty much wavelength independent, and so you might still win in terms of uh, what you ultimately can get for signal to noise. Okay, so here's kind of the last part of the, of the talk. And, yeah. um, coming back to, I said, 
traditional optics are like multiplying by complex diagonal matrices in between Fourier transforms. So there are a way we could do more general uh, matrix manipulations of linear algebra on light, and that would be great if we could do arbitrary things. And, and we're, yeah, I mean, in con conceptually and in principle, um, yes, we can. So there was a really nice paper, um, I thought a long time ago, when I was still, when I was learning about all this, um, uh, Olivier Guillaume just basically asked the question, what, what really is an ideal chronograph? What are we really trying to do? And he didn't actually use the words Hilbert space, you know, function space, whatever, but that, but he clearly, that's what he says in the paper, and it basically is the following. Um, let me, let me back up a minute. Um, this, as we recognize, this is the pupil electric field of what a star looks like. It was the points were right on the optical axis. That's the star. For telescopes like LUVAR, when we get to like 15 meters, the stars are really far away, but um, as, as telescopes of that size, we're going to actually, that star's going to no longer be a point source. We're going to actually start to barely resolve the stellar disk, which means that we have to suppress a family, a, a family of modes that are that are, have just a small amount of angular tilt. So the star right in the center has uniform, the uniform phase here. But part of the stellar disk over on the limb and stuff has just enough non-uniform phase that those modes at the pupil look like this. So we don't, not only do we have a job as the telescope gets bigger and bigger and bigger of suppressing just this mode, but a family of modes. So what can we do? What's the ideal? As you probably guessed, the ideal is just a Hilbert space uh, projection. Um, you can take all these modes and you can branch them and orthogonalize them to create an orthogonal family of modes. And then ideally what your chronograph would do would just say any mode, like a much more tilted mode, like I showed earlier for a planet, um, write that as a linear combination of two modes, one along the, in this subspace, uh, uh, and then something orthogonal to all of them. Block everything that is in this subspace and let all the orthogonals lay go through it. That's that would be the end of what you And it turns out that once you just write this down, in any basis, so I'm using this abstract kind of a, a coordinate free notation in like for Hilbert space modes. If you then choose your set of basis functions and however that works out, you would then have the matrix elements of that operator. And it turns out you can implement those with beam splitters. Um, and I'll get back to that. This shows the throughput curves coming up to one and compare those with what I showed earlier. Right. So there's, in principle, this is how much better you can do it. Basically, all planet light coming through. And this is the angular separation in over D. So basically, where you can find errors, you would have a huge amount of light coming through if you could achieve this kind of optical device that does this. Um, OK, so let's generalize it. Uh, or let's generalize it in a slightly different question. Suppose I do fix the chronograph downstream. What's, what is the ideal operator upstream? Uh, and it turns out it's a, what we ideally like to do is have a unitary operator that just completely rotates. Th this chronograph already has a null space. So I want to take these modes where I would just normally project them. The chronograph's doing part of that in some subspace, so I have to rotate them. So how do I do that? Well, it's just basically what we said before. I already said that for the star or any other mode in the pupil, here's that mode, I can solve this expression for the null space projection. I can take that mode and I can decompose it into a mode which is in the null space of the chronograph operator. And, and I'm only showing you like either the modulus or the real part here. Um, so I've already, you've already done that. And I'm just writing this now in the eigenmode form of that operator. That's all I'm doing. So then there's something left. That's just the other piece. If the chronograph was perfect and this already lived in the null space, um, then this would be equal to this. And there, this would just be a free mode with omega and zero. So, but I can take any mode and just do this decomposition. And numerically, we have the way to compute it. We can brute force compute uh, the projection of the null space. So, because I have this and some of these two guys, I can then construct another mode which is orthogonal to this. And I just have a little uh, 2D function subspace. And I can then analytically write down the unitary operator and kind of the input output representation. So the unitary operator would take this mode and send it to W. It would take this mode that's orthogonal to this and send it to this G. And anything else that's orthogonal to X and Y, and W and G are linear combinations of X and Y, or X and Y are linear combinations of W and G, it doesn't matter. Anything orthogonal to that, just let it go through. It should be the identity there. And so uh, remember I said that we've got, we've got more than one, and once the telescopes get bigger, we've got more than one mode that we need to suppress. So how do we generalize this? 
We also want to generalize this for all the different wavelengths as well, which slightly change the uh, pupil plane fields that are wrong. Well, how, so this trick, you can just keep going. You just take your first mode, you branch and orthogonalize all modes, the whole set that you want to suppress. So you have an orthogonal set, which I'm calling the X's. You take the first one, find its unitary, and it, by definition, what does it do to X1? It takes it to the null space guy. Take your second mode, decompose it now into the null space in G. Because it's unitary, X2, the unitary on X2 is still orthogonal to the unitary on X1. That means W1 is orthogonal to W2. It's also by definition orthogonal to G because this lives in the null space, but G is a combination of the modes that go through. So everything's orthogonal. So what's nice is that by then constructing a new unitary operator, I did no harm to the correction for the first mode. So I can literally just take a product of all these unitary operators. So I analytically, for however many modes you want, I just multiply them out, and I analytically have it. And then if you want to express it in any basis, you didn't look at the matrix elements for that. Why is the, so, so okay, I'm gonna to refer to this then as kind of a whole, what I would call a holographic approach to a unitary operator. Holograms just take an input electric field and an output electric field. Um, and it's really cool the way they do that. Um, you, you basically can write a phase variation that will do that trick for you, input to output both. This is, that's exactly what we want this unitary operator to do. It's basically with one mode, it's a hologram. We want to take the input mode to this mode, Y to G. If I, in the computer, um, represent, uh, represent this, um, then I'm showing you going from the initial, um, all those modes, I'm showing you then what happens to the dark hole going all the way through the program, just to show you it works. Um, and this is also then, by the way, showing, here's what, what happens to the star, it's completely nuked. And then um, what happens if I had a little off-axis source? So I'm taking a planet marching across. This is like half a lane, half a lane over D. So this is, this is, I'm now simulating those tilted modes through the unitary operator in the computer with that fictitious unitary operator, showing you that the point spread functions are great. I can simulate it, and that there's really nice throughput. Also, the word here was I better check that that light is still concentrated. So that was also why I did that. How can we build one of these things? Okay, coming back now, we're almost, we're almost there. Um, the beam splitters in patient here. So any unitary operator, I guess we know from numerical work, whenever you've got to solve the you know, inverse matrix and stuff, there's the um, what Gibbons, uh, Gibbons rotations and things, where you just take a, a cascade of two by two matrices and you can show that that factors any matrix, well, it matrices into uh, two guys as a product of two by twos and a diagonal matrix. Um, so for a unitary, what's really nice is, again, it's basically that trick. The unitary uh, operator can be factored in uh, two by two unitaries. It turns out what's really cool is that any two by two unitary can be represented with two one over root two beam splitters and phase shifters. So if you take the uh, the two uh, the, the two guys coming in here, you put a phase shift go through a one over root two beam splitter, another phase shift go through, you've implemented any two by two. So a, a network of these guys can implement any unitary operator. The question is, how do I take these abstract basis functions and get them into something that looks like, you know, an input-output matrix. Okay, so here's how we do that. Um, and this is where it's really starting to be like, this is stuff that exists and people are building it, but to be able to make this work for this application with the is going to require a lot of technology development for just engineering reasons. But what do you do? You can, I'm, I'm going to actually, instead of the pupil plane, I'm going to write, I can do the same math in the focal plane. So I'm going to take all the modes, go to a focal plane, where the light is nice and compact. And I'm gonna have a collection of, of uh, waveguides. And so this is exactly where I can take my light and put it in a specific set of basis functions. The basis functions here are these waveguides only will let light, uh, uh, certain modes of light, go down them. So think of a, a metal pipe, and you have light that comes through. Um, as you can imagine, the metal reflects and everything else. So you're going to solve a wave equation with purely reflective boundary conditions. And you know the eigenfunctions are sines and cosines. So wave guide, that's what wave guides do. They support fundamental modes. Um, you, can build, um, you can build things now where you can engineer what modes you want. You can also, with ultra-fast laser inscription and 3D blocks of crystal, um, here's the trick, right? You've got to take this light that's hitting in a planar surface and you've got to somehow map it into a 1D array that can then go into a circuit. How do you do that trick? You use ultra-fast laser inscription to write these waveguides that take that front planar surface and then they smoothly taper out into a fan out into a planar one 
a planar output. So they're on a plane that can then couple to, like they, they do silica, they, they write these waveguides down on silica things just like you do for uh, circuits, electric circuits, except now instead of you know, wiring with electrons, we're going to use light that's going to be piped through. These guys would go into the optical circuit now, the photonic integrated circuit, where um, those phase shifters, you can actually change the phase of light by putting a little uh, voltage across and change the phase. So I've got a, now a programmable optical circuit for any unitary operator. I can set the phases where I need them to realize the, the abstract representation of the unitary operator that I said. I can put it in the basis of these wave, uh, wave guys, solve for the solution on that basis, and do this trick. So now I'm kind of saying just a quick simulation, and then we'll be finished. Um, these, uh, these devices I'm talking about are, are, are cool, but uh, photonic lanterns, what they do, um, I said you can engineer the modes. So what I'm showing you is something called a few mode fiber, a uh, few mode waveguide, they're called fibers. Um, they only accept a couple of modes. And a Gauss, Gauss uh, Gauss-Germe uh, modes are a really good approximation to the modes that will couple strongly and go down. That's what they support. So, but here's what's really cool about photonic lanterns. They, on the front end, they can accept the light that's in any way in combination with gas gas-germe modes. They transition from something that supports like four modes into outputs that are single mode. So you, lit you literally locally, when the light lands there, you literally get to take the inner product of your electric field with these modes, and then the output of these devices is literally that complex number on that mode. So you just, there it is. Like that, that's the fundamental modal decomposition that you needed locally. You can resolve the big unitary in by end matrix in the basis of the gauss modes and uh, get a solution. And so there it is. That's the end to end way you can implement this in actual hardware. And this is just a solution showing you when I Fourier transform the pupil into the focal plane, there's that PSF with the area pattern. That's just it on zoomed in on the focal plane. This is showing you taking the Gauss-Germe decomposition uh, and then just showing you what that looks like by projecting it out back into things. Okay, that's just a quick little test. Um, if I needed more more fidelity, I could add more modes. Um, but this is just another test showing how much of the PSF core have I destroyed that by going into this basis? Because again, I need the final plan of light to be concentrated. Um, it's it's okay. And uh, then I'm just going to show you the solutions of doing the same thing of solving the entire operator. Here's the um, here's the mode. Here's the entrance aperture point source part of the star in the focal plane, and then um, showing you these idealized uh, solutions, but now in the focal plane gastronomic basis that are in the null space of the program. Um, I'm just showing you here, uh, just I guess for fun, really, what they look like for different apertures. Um, that kind of look weird. So, and then this is showing. Oh, okay, yeah, this is showing for the uh, centrally obscure, this, this app, this telescope. It shows again um, for all those stellar disk modes that I have to suppress. So there it is, and it just shows what they look like. And then, so the simulation down here is the final focal plane where I would have taken all those modes. In the computer, I simulate, I solve the unitary matrix in the gas gravity basis. So I take all these modes, I simulate going in, going through this device back out, and that's showing the final sense. So it's, it's around the corner. We've kind of got ways to build this stuff. The technology development that we need, uh, but we can't do right away. Um, wavelength dependence will be a problem. Again, different kinds of nonlinear wavelength dependence and uh, loss. Um, you've got to make these things really well because you, you, you don't want to lose any light. And we're barely getting any photons from the planet as it is. So like just literally plugging something like this into this, um, we'd have too much loss, too many losses. Like that. So that's, you know, we're, we're exploring this kind of solutions. But just to show you kind of a flavor of what you can do with linear operators in, a, in an optical set, um, that is, oh, yeah, that was again showing simulations of point spread functions. The only other thing I want to circle back to, everything I just said was was suppressing the diffractive starlight um, for the sake of the aperture, assuming that, that the mirrors were perfectly, you know, um, in, that, in the right shape. And so, of course, um, they're moving. The spacecraft changes thermally, mechanically. Uh, they're moving on the orders of you know, nanometers, and you have to do closed loop control to make it hold in good shape. We're going to have to continually be, so when I just put random tip-toe rigid body errors in the shape of the mirrors, 
on the energy space, problems, and they completely spoiled and infracted Starlink solution that I had. So I've got to close the loop on this, and I've got to um, have very accurate wavefront sensing so that when I sense the wavefront, I can feed it back to the control to adjust my deformable mirrors. Or in this fictitious device, I would have to very quickly close the loop and be reprogramming these little phase shifters in real time or something. So um, probably I would hopefully be able to get away with it with simpler deformable mirrors. OK, so all this shows, though, it's um, if I can sense this, that to, um, I have 10 nanometers of just kind of tip-toe piston air in these guys. But suppose I can measure it to 15 picometers. Uh, that's the air in my measurement. Then if I then resolved the unitary operator in real time, then this is the amount of time so I did So I went from totally coming it to, you know, something that we can live with. That's the 10 order to my two kind of suppression. So that's the kind of game we're going to have to play with. <laughs> with real systems is closing the loop, sensing things to ridiculous accuracies, and then quickly uh, having devices that we can uh, adjust the phase to uh, keep the starlight suppressed while we're looking at the planet and integrating. You know, we have to do this for long enough to get more photons from the planet. Um, so just a few references of Richard in any of these details. Um, uh, so plenty, plenty of other uh, challenges, uh, especially for the centrally obscured guys and just trying to bring some of this technology. This is just one route that might play off the technology. There's a lot of other exciting technology that going on, the star shades and, and other things. But, and so I think this is a really interesting question. You know, we're already, again, full, coming back full circle, we're directly imaging exoplanets. The push is, you know, they're there. We see them, we're trying to push into the innermost regions of these um, <coughs> solar systems around other stars in our galaxy. And we're, we're uh, moving forward on technology development so that we're going to be able to have large aperture space telescopes. And I essentially would ask what state-of-the-art telescope and high-contrast imaging will look like after you know 10 more years of development. That's it. Thanks, Jed. Um, so we have about five minutes. Uh, does anyone have questions for Jeff? Anything about the talk, about life at JPL? The camera's off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one question I had is, uh, in constructing these uh, mission operators, you assume that you know what the null space of this uh, current draft operator is, right? Like, how, in practice, how accurately can you measure that, or is there like, a way to, to construct that such that you know that you can always end up in that null space, or is there like, any numerical weakness in ending up in that null space? Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's a, um, yeah. right. In practice, you, you just try to measure as much as you can, really. I guess, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's not an idealized set. So, right. If you if you know it, you can go through this game and solve it. If you don't know it, yeah, you just have to measure as much as you can. Um, the good news is, uh, I guess maybe to shed light on that question, is the wavefront control part. We do have algorithms where. We, it, they're model based where it's kind of like you observe changes here based on you change stuff up here, you observe, you observe changes here, and you, you kind of assume a model that's got to be you know, basically accurate to first order uh, so that you can predict what you need to change such that you uh, affect the right change. And then you, then you iterate. And so, so far, basically, it seems that if you know your model you know, well enough, that then you're in the. But that, yeah, so um, apart from just measuring. Uh, you, you just kind of have to be careful and then the lab demonstrate that you're going to get down there. So, I mean, yeah, in practice that will translate. Like, we'll, what happens is it will also, in practice, will simulate various ways these guys can be imperfect in order to set limits on how well we have to make our But I think you answered a follow up question there, which was can that change in operation? Can you have ways to like, work yeah. around that in you know, real time? Yeah. It seems, it seems, it seems to be yeah. yes. Yes. It, yeah. And, it, and it, yes, it can. It, it can. It's closed with control. And again, right. And something I'm really interested in is revisiting algorithms or trying to develop algorithms where, you know, when you're using closed loop control, um, you've just made measurements and observed stuff by your system. You should be updating your models with the measurements in closed loop control to make it better, better, so that you. Because the name of the game again is to uh, have integration as quickly as possible, spend all your time integrating to get photons. So the more accurately you learn your model, you can be more aggressive in taking your steps. Um, and, then, and then again, uh, common filtering type things, where if things are slowly changing in time, you should be using that prior knowledge, but you get predictive control, all that stuff. Yeah, so all that stuff's kind of being explored and trying to be developed. Yeah. Uh, 
But, uh, what are the implications of putting this all on a rocket and launching it to space? Because I imagine that has some effects on like mirrors and the whole freak this freak this out. Thing. Yeah, like, there's no way it works as good if you put it in a rocket first. I, I agree with you. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of I'm new to this too, but like, we talk about like how sensitive this stuff is and people can control stuff, and I'm like, are you kidding me? We're gonna, you know, we all watch these movies like Apollo 13 or something else where you see how violent it launches. Yeah, um, they do it. I don't know. Hubble, for example, Hubble launched and yes, was serviced. Um, stay tuned, we've got a lot of trouble with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to be our first you know, segment at Aperture. It's got like one ring, right? So that's the first time we're actually about ready to launch something. We're going to, or we're going to have to be doing this kind of really precise control of a segment at Aperture Telescope in space. It's the next generation. So stay tuned on that. So all of that stuff we're going to be demonstrating. And yeah, apparently they have ways of keeping it safe enough to survive the launch. One of the things NASA has to do for all its missions is any instrument has to go through all kinds of crazy vibration tests. Um, they shake these things at different with different power spectra, different frequencies, and all kinds of thermal tests and everything else. To and, and they have to be designed to pass those tests. And those tests are set by launch. And in fact, those different vibe tests are are set by different launch vehicles because you can imagine some are more violent than others. I don't know any of this stuff. It's just great to. Okay, so that's when I say to JP, I'll like. Um, you know, it's just cool to be in meetings where you hear about stuff like that. But, you know, I, I never encountered any of that in grad school, right? But just to talk about what does it take to launch something and survive the vibration environment, you know, talking about launching and stuff. That's, that's uh, yeah. what, what other advantage of uh, uh, infrastructure space telescope over an Earth based radio wave telescope? Oh, okay. Um, we want to get at the optical first. So, um, well, it's the atmosphere. So, so, so the, um, the you asked about uh, what the advantage of uh, versus ground and radio. So we'd like to just get above the atmosphere because the atmosphere uh, has a lot of really fast phase variations, and, uh, and, and that that causes uh, all the cause their own version of that kind of thing that I was trying to correct. Uh, they the atmosphere is going to look like that, only even worse. And, and so. You want to get above the atmosphere. Oh, by the way, they do they do close loop control adaptive optics stuff on the ground, and that's really helped um, astronomy. Um, so you want to get above the atmosphere because you get more photons, and your telescope is much more stable. So you have a hope of pulling off some of this stuff. Um, and then in the optical, because uh, two to how many <coughs> microns, there's just a lot of really interesting um, stuff in the spectra of these planets that we'd like to take a look at. So that's driving the optical wavelengths. Uh, and so then once you decide your wavelength band for the science reasons, and the fact you want to get above the atmosphere, that kind of plays out in half the rest of it. This is awesome. I've never heard of the door talk like this. Um, TRL sprinkling. Um, um, <coughs> yeah, this is, I, I know this is the space. How, mu how much of this is um, TRL 7, right. like ver verified all that, and how much of it is low TRL? Yeah, this is actually the stuff, that's stuff I know the least about. Like, I like the math. Oh, okay, okay. In terms okay. Of, oh, that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all, let's see. Okay, so I don't remember how to attach numbers. Where am I going with this? Oh, so, okay, here we go. Okay, so like our deformable mirrors and stuff, yeah. um, those, you know, those those exist. They use them on the ground. I don't, I don't know if we've got flown, flown. Here's the space. So W first. So W first yeah. is going to be. It's a technology demonstration, and also doing science. I think that's going to be the first time we. No, James JWST will have a car graph. I don't remember if it has deformable one here, so I don't remember that. They might have something else, but I think W first then might be the first time we would fly deformable one here in space. So that gives you an idea that that's a first. Mm -hmm. um, segmented apertures then would be pretty high up on the TRL because we're going to fly one with JWST. Um, so at least the telescope part is there. Um, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff we're going to have to do for the bar that's probably low. Well, on the ground, like the metrology stuff, laser yeah. metrology. I think, I mean, that's on the ground. I don't know, I don't know what's up with space. So, that was, well, we, we, we're, so talking about, about, we're talking about the optical path and, and how like, putting it through some kind of um, some uh, phase uh, phase circuit would be a very challenging thing. Oh, yeah, that's like, that's so, like, it's here on like negative one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so this stuff, uh, but, but here's the reference. 
Um, these things, people build these things, those, those exist for um, totally different applications, optical and quantum computing experiments. Oh, so yeah, to get, yeah, and then people build these, the photonics, all the stuff that you, everybody wants monster bandwidth for, you know, yeah. TV stuff and everything else. So the, um, it's driving all this photonics um, development. And so that, but to apply it and to achieve lots of stuff, that's really about to okay. So it's kind of a road maybe potential technology development that would be cool. Sorry, real quick, could you expand that acronym? Oh, technology readiness level. Ready. Yeah. It's like grading, I guess, like how close it is to being ready to, right, like to put it into practice. Yeah, and you can imagine like NASA has very strict things about whatever you're going to launch, something has to be, well, I guess, TRL 7. So to achieve TRLs means you have to meet certain requirements and they're defined and things like that. To so even be considered in a mission proposal at some stage has to be, there's TRL requirements. Well, uh, we have a reception uh, in the CAM graduate office. The food just going to be there, so if you want to continue the discussion, uh, let's thank them one more time.